Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you uh, this morning, wherever you are joining us from. Um, my name is Anastasia Mercina, and I'm a Commercial Partnership Manager here at Child Accountants Ireland. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. Um, just start off with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this, um, this webinar will cover two distinct topics, one on cyber insurance and one on PI insurance. And we very much welcome your interaction and participation. So please um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you might have throughout the webinar. We will break um, halfway through the webinar after the cyber insurance um, part uh, will be finished. So you can ask any questions relating to that topic then. And then at the end of the uh, PI se session, um, as well at the end of the webinar, we'll cover the PI in, in insurance uh, uh, questions as well. So please use the Q&A button for that. The chat button can be used to report any technical issues and my colleague Chris will, will help you um, resolve any technical issues you might have. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to um, uh, Brian O'Mara. Brian is a, an account director with O'Leary Insurances and is based in the Cork, Cork office. He specializes in professional indemnity and cyber insurance. Brian will provide more detail on O'Leary's and his wider team across the country during his presentation. You're very welcome, Brian. Um, I'll hand over to you now. Cheers. Thanks, Anastasia. And hello to everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time this morning. Uh, if you're wondering why there's a cheetah on my screen, that's our, our, our uh, company mascot. So I'll explain a bit more about who we are shortly. Um, so let me just move on. So th this is split into two parts. I am um, before I get into it, I'm very conscious that you do you you would have the option to do a lot of CPD for professional indemnity. You had a cybersecurity event recently, so I have drafted this. Um, presentation with that in mind, try to keep it as relevant as we can. Um, the language won't be in any way techy for the cyber part. We give good examples of what we've seen among our own client base. So it's all relevant and it'll all be new, new to yourselves. Um, so with that in mind, I will, can I move that up here? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give an introduction to ourselves. I'll talk about cyber insurance in very basic terms. We'll go through some, the, the case studies is probably the real interesting thing about what we've seen among our own accountant client base and also the wider client base because a lot of these incidents will have, you know, they're industry agnostic. Um, we, it's not all just, here's the here's what happened and, and you're on your own. I, I'll give some you know, free resources that you can use to kind of improve your own cybersecurity um, posture and measures. And then finally, I'll talk about the cyber insurance product. So, um, I'll move that off my screen. Okay, so about O'Leary Insurances. So we are part of the Brown and Brown group. Um, so they're New York Stock Exchange listed. And as a group, we service over 28 billion of premium every single year, um, of which 250 million of that is placed by us here in Ireland. Uh, in Ireland, we've got seven locations, including um, Cork, Dublin, Galway and Waterford, and there's over 200 of us across the country. Um, so Brown and Brown is set up since 1939 and O'Leary since 1961. So both extremely long established. And we have had accountants as clients since the 1980s. So that would be everything from um, your uh, single practitioners up to, we have a, a couple of top 10 firms as well. Um, so about myself, uh, that's me. Um, I am an account director at O'Leary Insurances. I specialized in PI for my whole career since 2007 and uh, cyber since 2012, which is hard to imagine now. Um, the letters after my name are the associate of the Chartered Insurance Institute, Institute. And the only reason I'm putting them on there is because I spent an awful long time studying to get those letters and no client ever asked what they mean. So now you know. Um, I think that puts me in the less than 10% of the industry bracket. Um, my career has taken me from Dublin to Galway uh, with, with, with one particular broker. And then I went overseas for three years. I did a year in Sydney and a couple of years in Melbourne, again, with one broker um, before I was recruited to move back home to Cork in 2015. So um, to look after cyber and, and PI insurance. And I have been here for almost eight years now uh, with O'Leary Insurances. 
We have a good team working on accountants PI across the country. This is just a sample of some of them. So I have a couple of slides. Uh, Kieran um, made the mistake of forgetting to send me his profile photo. So he's got the Donald Trump uh, holding one. Um, Kieran's in Dublin, Finbar Cork, John Brennan is Dublin and Kenneth is in Galway. And we will be sharing the slides after. So you can, you can pull up these details if you want uh, to contact someone close to you. Margaret is Cork, Ronnie is Dublin and Rasa is in Waterford. Um, now, cyber insurance, what is it in, in very plain language? So a lot of brokers or insurers would give you a big kind of brochure and go away and read that and, and, and try and understand it or a policy wording. And to be honest, it can be broken down into three main areas that, that, that anyone can relate to. So the first one is to do with data breaches. So one thing, don't get fooled by that cyber is only for online data breaches. I have examples shortly of hard copy files going missing and, and, and decent amounts being paid because of that. And that would be covered by a cyber insurance policy. A data breach is a breach. So um, a data breach would be covered um, and it would be covered right from, let's say, uh, the, okay, when was the source of the breach? Who needs to be affected? Is it all our employees? Is it a section of our client base? Do we have to tell the data protection commissioner? Is there going to be fallout out of that? Uh, all those costs, uh, they can rack up pretty quickly and they will be covered by the policy. The one that we, we were saying is probably uninsurable um, is going to be an actual GDPR fine. And the reason we say that is because a GDPR fine, if it's punitive, is legally not insurable. Um, if it's non-punitive, it'll be insurable. To be honest, it's the, the fines can be a bit of a red herring, especially in Ireland. Our data protection commissioner is quite reasonable to deal with. Um, Helen Dixon's office, they're not like on the continent where they're kind of bulldogs and they punish you no matter what. If you know if it's a first offence and you are trying to do the right thing, they don't generally go, go hard on the fines, but there's still significant costs incurred in just dealing with a breach, um, even small ones. And again, I have a couple of examples. So a network security incident. So easy for all of us now in Ireland to understand that because of what happened to the HSE. So a ransomware attack. And I have a good example on the next page of how the policy would respond to something like that. So I'll, I'll postpone talking about that for a second. And cybercrime. Cybercrime is actually the biggest area of loss among our client base. So cybercrime would be you are someone in your practice losing your monies or your clients monies to cyber criminals um, it's hugely common and you just, there's a good reason that the Gardaí and the National Cyber Security Centre are running ads on the radio at the moment it's probably one of our most active areas of claims as a book of business um, across all insurances it's it is hugely common if you think you are not going to get caught out um, I've seen some fairly sophisticated attempts over the years for, for companies that had good measures in force one massive benefit of the policy of having a cyber insurance policy would be the crisis response. So that's 24 seven response. So let's say you're in this webinar now and next thing everyone's system in your company gets locked down. So the whole practice is locked because somebody had clicked something they're not meant to. It's a ransomware attack. And it's that resource at the end of the phone to go help. And then the insurer can go, well, okay, we've seen that before. We know how to deal with this. Let's start working on it. You need IT forensics. You might need legal people. Maybe we even need PR people. We're here to help you. The, the good thing about cyber insurance claims, because I do get asked about, about the claim service, the insurer's interests and your interests are very much aligned, and that is to get this resolved as quickly as possible and keep the costs down. So let's do an example of a, a network interruption matter. Um, we are going to... Um, uh, so let's pretend we have a timeline here, and the... We're going to pretend right now we have, I think my screen's frozen a bit, one sec, there we go. Uh, we have a ransomware attack in April uh, right now. And the first thing we're probably going to have to do is go back in time and figure out, well, when did we get breached? It was actually in January. So the cyber insurance would send in the IT forensics people. Now, they might be your IT people, or if they don't have the capability, they'd be the insurer specialists. Um, and they go in and they get to the root cause of the breach and go, okay, we've now fixed where it was, we found out what it was, we found out who's affected. All the while you're trying to figure out who's affected, notify the data protection commissioner, and you're also trying to get back up and running from your backups, whether they're in the cloud or, or, or on a server or wherever they are. It's unbelievably common for a company not to have um, uh, uh, the, the backups not to be what you think they are um, are as good as you think they are. So 
a company thinks they're doing backups every month and they go away and they actually go to work from them and they realize they're actually not worth what they thought they were. So that's a big um, issue for the there's a good learning there is to test your backups and how could you get back up and running from them um, every, you know, even once or twice a year. So let's then it's taking to August, um, but it's all very slow and your whole systems are down. And remember, the, if you remember the HSE attack, they were down for probably over a year, some departments. So, OK, our all of our organizations are much smaller than the HSE, but it, it could still take a significant amount of time. And now let's pretend that you either you or the insurer go, the backups aren't working, it's taking too long, we need to get back up and running. So we're actually going to pay the ransom. Now, in reality, ransom is paid about between 30 and 50% of the time on the cyber claim. So let's pretend we've paid in September. If you'll remember the HSE, they got the ransom decryption key pretty quickly um, uh, relative to when the hack happened. And yet they were down for over a year later. It's not just put in a key and flick a switch and you're back up and running. So it, it's, it's not quite as easy as people think. It, it does take still a good bit of work to get back up and to where you are, but you could probably get critical systems back up quicker. And let's pretend of those affected, someone brings a claim and says, there's a liability matter here and, and you know, you've know you lost my data. Again, I have an example coming up. Um, that would be covered by the policy, it would help respond to that. Or if there was a regulatory action too, it would help handle the costs around that. And let's pretend you're, you, you know, the managing partners, the senior partners are all, you know, certain people are taken out of the business, you're losing income, your reputation is damaged, some clients have moved away and, and others won't come to you. That is insurable under the better policies. Um, now, one important point here is a lot of you may have business interruption insurance, and that would be uh, under your property or your office insurance. And business interruption will generally cover physical uh, loss to your business. So, you know, fire or flood. If your systems are locked down now to a ransomware attack, your building is perfectly intact. So it doesn't trigger your property or office policy. So that's where a cyber network interruption policy fills the gap. Now here's, as I said, these are probably the most interesting because these are actual case studies among our client base. So these are all accountant examples. So this is a small ransomware attack. Um, it was a phishing attack. So someone was sent an email, let's say, pretending to be from on post or a bank or Ryanair or one of these. Uh, they thought it was legitimate. They clicked the link and long story short, a ransomware attack happened. And this particular accountant paid the ransom and it was about 8,000 um, plus the cost to get back up and running. Um, Ransomware, cybercrime is the biggest area of claims among our particular client base, but ransomware is by far the biggest globally. And the sums are going up massively because the attacks are way more targeted. So you've got to imagine someone sitting in your system for four or six months, maybe a year. They know how big you are and they go, you know, you've got revenue of this much, you can afford a big ransom. Um, and, 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 you know, it's a lot more targeted and sophisticated and it's a lot more. The, the other dual threat now that they're, they have is that they'll release the data that they've taken. They've got all your client data and they'll release that if you don't pay the ransom. So it's all about putting pressure on you. Um, so it's been a huge problem in, in, in um, insurance over the, over the years. Um, cybercrime, the, so this was... Uh, so I sorry, I can see a question there, but I'll just answer that quickly. Uh, if you pay a ransom, are you at risk of facilitating money laundering and therefore engaging in an illegal activity? So there is a I could I could go in, into this one all day, and the long and the short of it is um it is a big area of ethics in cyber insurance. Um and are you funding terrorism and all uh, all these considerations, like let's say North Korea, their biggest export now is cybercrime and, and taking money in that way. Um the insurers will generally, there's a, they're not allowed to pay to sanctioned countries. Uh, they have restrictions around that. Um, so this will all be factored into it. Um, in the worst case scenario, they'll build your systems from scratch. Uh, the policy is there once the limit is sufficient, which like generally it would be. Um, so there is, you are funding illegal activity if you're paying the ransom. And when I say that 30 to 50% of ransomware claims end up being the ransom being paid, that's not at the insurer's behest. It's because the client, we, everyone starts off wanting to build up from their backups, but then the reality bites of not doing business and, and the, the insured goes to the insurer, I want you to pay the ransom. I need you to get me back up and running. So it's, it's a discussion. It's kind of fluid. Uh, we came across a large cybercrime loss. Um, the, 
this was a firm hacked. Um, the hackers were in their system for quite a while and they, they wait, they, they build up a profile of you interacting with your clients, how you talk to them, and they pick their time to strike. So they would have waited till a few you know, payments were due, be they invoices or your clients got to transfer your monies for some reason. And they pick that time to take over the email chain. So you think you've emailed your client, they've diverted that email to a folder and they've jumped in on the chain. The whole chain is there and they've set up a fake email address. So let's say there's a zero and uh, an O in your, your the name of your practice that might change to a zero, you know, an L might change to a capital I. You, you just little amendments that you wouldn't pick up um, unless you were very careful. So the criminals are now in control of the email pretending to be the firm. They say, here's our bank details for the transfer. And the bank, the, the client who isn't on a webinar like this isn't aware of, you know, I need to pick up the phone um, to check new bank details, transfers money. And typically enough, typical in this case, it was their largest client who was transferring them 100,000 who fell for it. Uh, the funds weren't recovered. Now you might be saying, but the practice never had the question, they never had the uh, funds that they didn't lose them. Uh, in that case, it was covered by cyber insurance because number one, it was their biggest client and it was that in, that individual's own monies. So they were quite conscious that they wanted to keep that person as a client. Um, and number two, if you go down the legal route of proximate cause and proximate cause being what was the source of the loss, the original source, and without the firm being hacked, that loss doesn't happen. So because the firm's resources were weak, that's what happened. So those type of losses are always, they have they, they take on a life of their own. You'll see potentially IT providers dragged into claims. You'll see the firm dig their feet in the sand and say, absolutely not, nothing to do with us. Um, there's no one precedent for how those claims work, but in this case, it was 100,000 and it was fully settled by the insurer. Um, do you have to confirm that you aren't paying ransom to sanctioned entities in our countries? So generally, um, ransom, it's, it's, it's not the, um, the person in the bedroom, uh, the teenager in the bedroom anymore carrying out these attacks. It tends to be a um, very organized entities. And we are talking, there's one uh, crowd in Russia that um, had a call center to help you pay them in Bitcoin, working nine to five holidays, everything. They are seriously... Um, professional organizations. This is bigger than the, glo the global drugs trade. So if you were suffer a ransomware attack, it'll be known who was behind it very quickly. Um, it, so there was a drop in ransomware last year. And the reason for that was almost certainly because most of the ransomware attacks were being run out of Russia. And with the war in Ukraine and sanctions, they couldn't get paid. Their efforts were being diverted towards the war in Ukraine. Um, and there was actually literally a dip in ransomware, but it's already picking back up again. But, but it's known who's behind these groups. The vast majority, I would say over 99% of the time. Um, to go back to the next example, which is CEO fraud. Uh, now this one was prevented, but it was going to be for tens of thousands of euros. Um, so what it was, was someone in the practice got an email to their phone purporting to be from the managing partner using the type of language they would have used you know leads drew last night know you're a leads fan blah 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 um it looked legitimate and it said can you transfer money to this account um for a client the person in the practice was about to do the transfer and they were making their way back to their desk and they just logged on to their pc and that's when they could see they noticed the email address wasn't the managing partners. It would have been changed. So they just missed out on doing the transfer. They rang the managing partner and said, I didn't, I didn't send that at all. Um, and I have seen plenty of glasses where that has actually happened. Um, and the last one here is a data breach. So this is back to my uh, a hard copy data breach can be covered. So this was an accountancy practice where there was a temporary member of staff and they were asked to post some P60s and bank statements to, the, to a client. The client used a property and had a letting agent and they accidentally took the address of the letting agent off the system, posted the P60s and the bank statements to the letting agent who opened them. And when they realized, they told the client, they told the accountancy practice, so everyone was aware what happened. The client wasn't happy and took an action against the, it was the husband and wife, they took an action against the practice. And under GDPR, you don't have to prove you've suffered a loss. Um, to take an action and the long and the short of it was much to the accountant's chagrin they had to the insurers had to settle for uh, 10,000 per person they had to make a settlement offer to avoid this going to court um, 
Uh, how do they? So I, I can see two more questions. How do they know who to target in a ransomware attack? Are they taking their name from the social media or website? Um, yes, the Gardaí's advice would be, um, and our own company is, doesn't do this. Uh, or the Gardaí advice would be not to have personal details on your website because fishers and 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 and, uh, and criminals will use that. Um, you know, they'll say Brian O'Mara, I'm Brian O'Mara, or I'm the managing director. They, they'll build up a profile that way. Um, there's lots of reasons, there's lots of different ways. You, your um, employees might use their work e email to do, to buy something off a third party. That third party could be hacked. Now they have their email address and all these details. Um, there's, there's lots of different ways. I mean, I don't know. I imagine nobody on this webinar could turn around and say, I've never got an email that wasn't, you know, a phishing email. Um, our emails are out there and our contact details, they're not that hard to find, especially with the likes of LinkedIn. Our PCI, so our payment card industry uh, breaches normally covered. Um, yes, they are insured under uh, pretty much every policy I've seen. So the, the answer is a simple yes to that. Um, so cyber insurance, so these are examples among other clients, but I'm just going, I'm putting this up there to show you a cybercrime is cybercrime. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant in Ireland or a manufacturer in India. If you're on the the greater World Wide Web, uh, you're in scope. So like these are among our clients. They're all real. So in 2021, there's a few examples in agriculture, engineer, healthcare, religious. These are only the ones I could fit on the screen, to be honest. Uh, we came back from Christmas in um, early 2022, um, and it was a solicitor had actually lost well over a million to cybercrime. Um, the fact the office was closed helped the criminals get the money away and not recoverable. So there was a good six figure amount recovered and the loss was still over a million and it is fully insured. Um, that's the biggest one we've seen recently um, and it's fairly debilitating. And this was a firm with, I think, five staff in total. We're not talking. It, it, whatever the most you're transferring at any one time, that's the most that's at risk, or sorry, not even at any one time, because you could lose two or three transfers in, in a go. Um, whatever you're transferring, that's what's at risk to cyber criminals. Uh, with food industry, 145, and just last month, a tech firm, and you know, tech firms are fairly savvy on this front, and yet somebody in the organization uh, was the victim of, of a phishing attempt and they lost 54,000. So again, it's hugely common, it's a big area of loss, um, and it's just to be aware of it and, and there has to be a culture within your accountancy practice of keeping, on, you know, keeping people aware. So, for example, if we get a fraudulent email, we do a print screen of it and we send it to IT. And if they get, we'll say, two people sending on one from, I'll pick on Unpost again, sorry, Unpost, um, and it's not, it's not a legitimate or a TV license, they'll take that print screen, send it around the whole organization and say, reminder, don't click on links Don't do that for, for emails where you weren't expecting. Don't use your work email for personal emails. And we all know it, but it's just keeping it front of mind. It's a small little thing. And on that note, I, I just have a few resources for you to, um, you know, it's not all here. So here's the bad stuff and you're on your own or you, you need insurance. It, it's, 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 um, there's some very good stuff out there. So here's one thing you could all do today if you haven't already. So if you look up Google's jigsaw fishing quiz, um, and these slides will be shared after you'll find this, no problem. Um, in fact, I think I may have shared the link uh, with CAI. If not, I can do it. It's very easy to find, eight questions, and it's like you, you set yourself up. It, it takes five minutes, but it's really good. At, it, 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 is this a phishing email or not? And it's really hard, to be honest. And if, if you don't learn something from it, you're a better person at this than I am. Um, I did it about two years ago, and I think I got... I think it's eight questions. I think I got eight out of eight. I did it there last month and I got two wrong. So um, I'd forgotten stuff over the years. So that's a really good one. What, what we do in our place or what we did was we sent it around, told everyone to do it by the end of the week. And it actually got a bit of, uh, you know, banter in the office of how are you getting on? What did you get? Um, go on YouTube, loads of training videos, look up what you want, phishing or ransomware, or, you know, you, you can you can find things and you can, you can take learnings and send them on. Um, if anyone has cyber insurance, pretty much every insurer, they're self-motivated, they have resources that their insureds can avail of. So as a policyholder, you get them. Um, and they might be along the lines of these, uh, what, what I've explained already. Um, so it might be videos or training or tests. Um, and it's all about making you a better risk to them. Um, 
speak to your IT providers. They're the obvious ones. Uh, look, most things will come with a cost, but at least if you have a cost in front of you, you can weigh up if you want to go down that route or not. Um, so the next, the middle one there is the Cyber Ireland Four Pillars. So Cyber Ireland are Ireland's national cybersecurity cluster. Uh, so it's a not-for-profit, um, and it, what it is, it consists of government departments, the National Cyber Security Centre are in there, uh, academia, so all the universities tend to be in there, and industry, so we're a member of it too. Um, and what it is, it's us, it's us trying to make Ireland Inc. Uh, better from a cyber security perspective, because it makes us more resilient to ransomware attacks as a country, it makes us more attractive as a, uh, for doing business as a country. Um, so it's all very well intentioned. And what we've been working on is that the four pillars is going to be a kind of framework or a certification or a standard um, CI4 for short. And it's four simple steps that any SME can undertake. And if they do those, you may be doing them already. You may be doing two or three of them already. If you do those, they are the basics and they get you as a, you know, as an SME, they get you up and running in terms of cybersecurity. Um, the one big carrot at the end of it is there will be the option for pretty cheap insurance and I'm talking probably a couple of hundred euros for a quarter of a million a cover um, for firms with up to one million turnover and then it does increments up to 20 million turnover. Um, it, it's competitively priced, it's a good wording, but if you're the insurer, if you put yourself in the insurer's shoes, it's win-win for them because they're getting a better quality of, of um, SME because they've been through the four pillar process. So it's designed to be very easy to follow. We've just done the pilot phase in March, I think it was. Um, it went well, it was good and educational. We took a few learnings from it. I have put expected rollout question mark because it's, there's a big jump from a pilot phase to rolling this out nationally. Um, we're talking to various government ministers and departments, etc. But I would say in my head, I'm guessing it's probably six months plus, but uh, it's kind of a watch this space. If you want to keep abreast of that, the last thing I've done there is we do a complimentary risk management newsletter. Uh, it's four per year, so one every quarter. Um, what's on it would be exactly what I've talked about today. Uh, it would, we give case studies, what we've seen in the last three months and it's all, we don't delve too deep into anything. It's like four pages of content in plain English and it's just designed to get you going. Oh, maybe I should think about that. Maybe I should talk to my IT provider and it's keeping, keeping things front of mind. Um, so I'm seeing a comment there, uh, public sector is particularly vulnerable, public procurement, e-tenders website requirement to publish details on quarterly basis of purchase or orders issued in excess of 20,000. All these put valuable info into the heads of criminals. Yeah, true. And look, the criminals will, I mean, at the start, they might be pretty indiscriminate in who they'll target, to be honest. And it's, 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 that's what I mean. Just because we're in Ireland, we think we sometimes that, you know, sure they, they'll go after the higher profile Americans or the UK or whatever. If you have a website, they don't really care where your domain is. Um, but uh, that's I, I don't I must admit I don't know an awful lot about the e-tenders, so I won't say too much about that. Um, uh, last slide on cyber is uh, or two slides is that the, the product. So we've been working in this area. Like I said, I moved home in 2015. Um, so since then, we have access to the market leading product. So the best one we have access to would have cyber crime cover up to. Um, oh, thanks. I see the phishing quiz has been posted in the chat, by the way. Um, so the product would have cyber crime cover up to 250,000. Um, it would include fully retroactive cover. So let's say you took out a policy today, but you were hacked six months ago and you didn't realize it. That would be covered automatically. 24-7 um, claims handling is a must for cyber insurance. Uh, expertise is crucial, claims expertise. So like you have to have people at the end of the line immediately. So this particular policy, if you look on the right, has a phone app. Um, and the phone app is used for two things. One is for you to notify a matter immediately. If your systems are locked down, you can go on your phone and notify the insurers and talk to someone. And the second way is they tell you if there's something you need to be aware of. So they, they don't send, the alerts work out at like one or one to three per year. They don't go, every single policyholder gets every alert they're targeted to your sector um, or, or your geography, depending on. Uh, there's no restrictive conditions in the wording. There's one thing I get asked is what's in there that they can avoid a claim if I don't update my antivirus. There's nothing in there, only pay the premium. That's the only condition. Uh, that, that That's quite restrictive. Um, sorry, that's not re quite restrictive. That's the only one that says that's a warranty in the policy. Um, the excess 2,500 usually is the starting point. 
point, so it's quite pretty low. Threat monitoring, I'm going to talk about. Um, I have an example of that shortly, but basically, you don't have to do anything, but just by you being a policyholder, you have the insurers during the year checking your systems. So it, threat monitoring is basically, if you imagine your house, it's basically like walking around your house and checking are your windows and your doors unlocked. If they're unlocked, the insurer is not going to go in. They're just going to tell you, we found a potential vulnerability. Um, do you want to go in and fix it? That's one example. They offer good risk management tools. And I said, I mentioned the app already. So this is a bit text, text heavy, but this is an example of threat monitoring that I got only last month for a client of mine. So basically, uh, the insurer came across their name. So uh, again, talking about ransomware, the Royal Ransomware Group is, is the name of the ransomware group. So they're well known. And they were about to carry out a campaign on Monday the 20th and Tuesday the 21st of March. And my clients, three of my clients' um, uh, employees, the founder and two others, their names were on the email list for targeting. So our uh, this the, the emails were already sent. This was notified to me, I think, in maybe late March. Um, they they were flagging it. The insurer was telling the client um, via us, the broker, just to be aware of this. Go check. Go. You know, the IT people would know what to do here exactly. But it's just it, it's just to show you there's a service in the background being run. It's an extra level of protection just by being a policyholder. You can see the benefit from the insurer's point of view again if you think about it. They're um, you know, they're they're covering themselves and reducing the likelihood of a loss if they're getting to these before the criminals can. That's kind of it. And uh, I think there's been a decent few questions there. So um, I'm, oh yes, one sec, I see one more. What's the ballpark cost of cyber insurance? Um, yeah, I did have a look before we came on. So for like the market leading product I mentioned there, so we have everything from um, small firms to we do have a top 10 firm buying it. And it's, you're talking in the range of three to 6,000 um, for maybe a million a cover. Um, it's not that expensive. It, it does, it's quite bespoke now. It depends on your risk management and all that. So if someone got a higher quote, it might be because of claims or it might be because they didn't have all the necessary um IT measures, but I didn't see any on our system that were higher anyway. So it's not crazy money. And you might think 3000 is a high starting point, but if, if you lost a hundred grand to cybercrime, you know, you'd have a very different opinion. Um, so that's kind of roughly what you're talking. The Cyber Ireland project will bring the cost uh, down. There'll be no cybercrime cover under it. So cybercrime is an add-on that, that's not available under the, the CI4 that I, the, the project that I mentioned is just not in scope. Um, I think there's be plenty of questions there. Do you have any more, yeah. Anastasia? Um, thanks, Brian. Uh, that that's been really, really good. Um, just one more popping up here, and I think you mentioned it within that product review about the restrictive conditions. But do are there policies that uh, tend to have any restrictive conditions, like having an antivirus up to date, yeah. um, out there? Yeah, we we thanks we we we've um oh, I they do. In, in short, it was worse. Maybe uh, if you went back eight years ago, the variance between one policy wording and the other was night and day. The insurers have had to up their game and come to a kind of, um, you know, improve their wording or else the better brokers wouldn't place pol policies with them. Um, I've seen everything like I, I've seen some clauses whereby if you followed the steps the insurers wanted, you couldn't have had the loss. So what were they covering really? Um, but to be honest, like I can say hand on heart for our client base, I know that we're using the better wordings and we'll, we'll happily get the insured to pay a premium. And if we explain why they're paying a premium above, you know, the other policy wording, it's a no brainer for them. It's, it's, you can have a piece of paper, you can have something that actually responds to what you want. So I've seen some restrictive ones over the years. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I don't think we have any more questions on cyber um, at the time now. Cool. Um, but if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to uh, use the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen for any more questions. Great. Now I'll move on to the look the PI. The PI section is, is relatively short. And again, I'm conscious you've already done PI CPDs this year, last year, the year before. So I, I don't want it to be dry and, and boring. I'm trying to keep it relevant. So this is just on tips on how to present your PI insurers to give yourself the best the best result possible. Um, so very quickly, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with PI, I'm going to presume most are, but I'll give a very quick introduction. Um, then the tips and, and just a quick note on the PI market at present. So 
For anyone who doesn't know, PI is a policy. Professional indemnity insurance protects you and your firm against claims from a third party arising from allegations of negligence. So use allegations because you don't have to be in the wrong to have a claim brought against you and that can incur costs and breach of your professional duty. So basically your service is being provided to clients if your client alleges you did something wrong. Uh, and legal defence costs would also be covered by this policy. You can actually have a bit of a crossover between PI and cyber, but I, I won't go down that, that rabbit hole today. Um, for the CAI, it's, I know it's the vast majority on the call are, are CAI members. Um, just be conscious your insurer has to be on the CAI approved list. Uh, that's available online. Don't be running off panicking. I've, I've not seen someone who wasn't in recent years. Um, the, the, just the reason they were wanted the, 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 to be on that list, you have to include a clause which says um, where the insurer's policy wording isn't as good as what the CAI minimum standard is, the CAI minimum standard applies. So it gives you some benefits and it ensures a fairly level playing field across the wordings. There is some which have better bells and whistles than others, but there's a good minimum standard there once they're a CAI approved insurer. Now, uh, presenting your PI renewal to insurers. So uh, the context here being just pretend you're an underwriter, the person who puts the price on your renewal premium or your new business submission to an underwriter uh, in an insurer. And they have loads of proposals on their desk for architects, tech companies, tree surgeons, solicitors, whatever. And your, your accountant's form is in, in the middle of that and it's a busy day. You want them to be in a good mood. Uh, you want them to give it their best effort. And like the, the first one is probably the most basic here, but is 2023 a typed form? Is it very achievable and is much better than a handwritten one? Like, why would the insurer want to be trying to read over your handwriting um, if it's not very legible? If they're if they have to go back and query things, if they're looking at it as a new business inquiry, and they're you know they're on the fence, they might just move on from it. It might be easier for them to go. I'm just not going to get back on this one, or I'm going to decline it. Um, believe it or not, you know, if they're absolutely up the walls, busy. So help yourself. Uh, Typed forms are, are, are widely available for different insurers. If the form says to supply supporting information because you've ticked yes or no or whatever uh, throughout it, don't forget to attach it. Um, what I would also say is these forms are very generic. Um, they're designed for like they're designed for everyone from, you know, general practitioners to insolvency to different specialities. If you're a speciality and, you know, there's a yes, no question, you're going, I know if I answer no here, it looks bad, but it's not the full story because uh, it's not quite applicable or whatever the reason is. Do a cover letter. I mean, no point sending 10 attachments supporting different things, but do a cover letter explaining, um, you know, positive things that your firm does or something that you feel the proposal firm doesn't fully address. It reads, it, it usually reads very well and gives an impression of we've put thought into this and we put thought into our risk management, which the insurers like answer all the queries and it's like your broker should be able to help you. We can't fill out forms for you, but we can talk you through any that, that come up. Plenty of accountancy firms have had claims. They've had claims that have been successfully defended, have gone nowhere, whatever the case may be. The claim doesn't mean you're not going to get quotes. So if you have claims, there has to be a story behind them that you present to the insurers. Again, cover letter is a good one. But if you're getting the claims experience, um, it'll say if matters are open or closed, but you mightn't have got the claims experience in two years off a broker because you left that broker two years ago and you don't want to go back to them. But if the matters were open and the reserves were, you know, the date on the claims experience is 2021, 2020, um, it's not current anymore. The reserve could have doubled, it could have trebled, it could have gone down to zero or, or lower than it was. So it's not of much use. Um, people doing their own claims experiences only have limited use. Um, the insurer really would want to see an up-to-date claims experience. So you, you, you're you well within your rights. It doesn't have to be your broker anymore. Go back to the old broker and say, I'd, I'd like a claims experience, please. If you're very uncomfortable, ask your current broker, can they get it for you? Um, it shouldn't take more than a day or 48 hours. The The real important thing and, and the, the real learnings is what lessons were learned um, because of the breach. You know, was it, take for example, and this, this goes back to the proposal form as well. Let's say, you were overstretched, um, you grew too fast. It's a big issue for construction during the Celtic Tiger. People grew too fast. There wasn't the oversight and mistakes happened. So well, what learning did you take from that? Um, you know, have you, have you slowed down the pace of growth? So like go back to the proposal form. If your turnover has gone from 200,000 to 600,000 in a year, 
that's going to be a question for an insurer if the number of employees hasn't gone up or if the senior number of partners hasn't gone up, but the juniors has, you know, who's, what's the oversight like? Are you getting stretched or should I be worried here? Um, if there's any changes been made because of claims, practice or risk management changes, highlight them in the cover letter. Um, I've seen some really good ones. You know, we, we had one particular firm last year that had claims issues in the past and we were able to take a good presentation because they were like a completely different practice now to what they were then. They, they were clear of all those issues um, and we were able to take it to the insurers and the insurers took it on board of this firm is less likely to have a claim than, than most because they've, they've been burnt and they've completely changed how they go about doing things. Uh, I said, had, have a clear renewal strategy. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, sorry, strategy won't be the same for everyone. So you might have just notified a circumstance that that dictates you should go one direction, perhaps. You might you might have marketed it last year. Well, do you want to talk to your broker and see has the market changed? Because if it hasn't, and you're just sending your farm around to, if you're telling them to market for the sake of it, it's not the most attractive to the potential insurers to see your farm year after year, because they go, I'm not really going to go hard on this because it's a rental because it'll move the year. I'm not competitive. Whereas if they see it every three years, five years, they go, okay, I haven't seen this one before. Why is that? Oh, they, they like building up a relationship with their insurer. Well, I could be that insurer. And, you know, the, 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 they might go a bit harder on that type of, of, of firm. Um, but generally speaking, your broker should be reaching out, let's say eight weeks in advance to plan for the renewal, be that a call, a meeting, whatever the case may be, talk it through. That gives you, here's your form. You've got, two weeks a month to return it um that's the ideal time to give us four to six weeks uh it gives us plenty of time to approach potential insurers and um you know even if we want to focus on the incumbent and then okay let's see what the incumbent does and if we're happy great we, we've saved going around to the market and and you know like i said i mean to go going going around for the sake of it whereas if we're unhappy it gives us time to respond and go a bit further afield and see what's out there uh, one thing I've put in there is to understand competition at the broker versus the insurer level. So I suppose there's a common perception and it's probably because of tight agents in other insurance industries and all that. But there might be a misconception that if I got to three brokers or four brokers this year, I've covered off the market. But the reality is, especially for the larger brokers, we have access to all the insurers. So all you're doing is an insurer might see your farm, uh, you know, three or four times. Um, the it, it if I'm if I send in a proposal form to insure and they've already seen it twice, they're probably less likely to quote it because they're kind of going, I don't want to pick a broker to back. If I quote it, what am I doing? Am I really going to pick it up? I mean, it's obviously gone all around the market and, and it's just doing the rounds. So they, they, this does factor into their their thinking. If your broker, you can talk to your broker and ask them, what insurers do you have access to? How many do you have access to? Is it the whole market? Um, if it is, well, then can't the broker do the competition part for you and bounce the insurers off each other and the insurers know that one broker is working on it? Um, it's a bit of a different way of thinking about it, but it's, it's just something, it is food for thought. And final slide. Um, so the PI market and where it stands at the moment. So the market cycle we're in is... Um, we had a hard market from 2018 to 2021, if not early 2022, which meant high premiums, hard to get insurer capacity. It was all a bit difficult. Um, and insurance works in cycles. We're now at the soft part of the cycle. Long may it continue. It means um, uh, easier to get quotes, premiums, a bit more competitive. There's more capacity. And what I mean by that isn't more new insurers. I just mean the ones that have gone through their difficult period are now opening their books to new business inquiries again. Um, one thing to be conscious of, if you buy, let's say, a five, a six million, a four million limit, most insurers won't quote above a two and a half million or a two million limit. So if you need a limit of five million, you're going to need probably two insurers, uh, two plus a six and a half, you probably need three. Um, if you think you've only got one insurer for six and a half million limit, I bet you if I showed you on your policy document, there'd be three insurers on there. Um, so why I'm saying that is because it takes a bit more time to build that up sometimes. Uh, the insurers generally, to be honest, the accountancy market is fairly stable. Uh, you have a lot of long-term providers. There's, I think there's one new one coming in, but all they're doing is taking over the book of one that's in there already at, at the smaller end. Um, 
it'll be steady as she goes with them. Uh, outside from that, I'd say the last new entrant was probably four or five years ago. And I think there's one more potential that they've just entered the UK and they're dipping their toes in and they're thinking about Ireland at the moment. Um, the one thing to be aware of, and I'm not being self-serving, I'm just being factual. There's one insurer that's exclusive to a broker and that's us and an insurer called CNA. So CNA have been in the market for 15 plus years um, and the only broker they'll quote is ourselves. Um, so that's, uh, apart from that, I can't think of any insurers. I have, I've racked my brains. There's none that are exclusive to any broker. Um, claims expertise of the insurers is important. Again, you can talk, ask your broker about this. Who's their claims people? Where are they based? Are they in Dublin or the UK? You know, what's their, what are, what's their service like when something does happen? Um, for, okay, I have a question there. For how long should one retain PI insurance after the sale or transfer of an accountancy practice? Um, see can i dig uh, it, it, it's so basically um what you're asking is about runoff insurance so runoff would be I, i'll start at the start uh for everyone your pi policy will cover you uh let's say th this the policy you have enforced today will cover all past claims so if a claim came in for work done two years ago it's this year's policy that responds uh if you sold your practice tomorrow and the new practice uh, the new owners covered the insurances from tomorrow's activities onwards, you've got to cover everything that was carried out until tomorrow. Uh, so that's runoff insurance and it should, premium should go down over time because the risk is going down year on year. The general recommendation, I think the CAI have a minimum of two years requirement and that, uh, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, if anyone wants to query it with me specifically, I, I'll find out afterwards. Uh, six years would be your statute barred um, for most instances. So if you wanted to cover off your liability, and again, I'm not a solicitor, so I can't give legal advice, but six years tends to be the statute of limitations. Um, generally speaking, in practice, people will probably usually go for it. They'll do it in year one, they'll do it in year two, and then they'll consider what's the cost and what's the risk to me. Like I often hear I've no skeletons in my closet. I, I know exactly what work is done and I'm happy to let that lapse um, after two years. So it's kind of up to you, but 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 um, six years would we'll be covering yourself really. Uh, that's kind of it from me guys. So um, I don't know are there any more questions. Thanks for all the questions. Actually, that kept it interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you for everyone who submitted their questions so far. Just a couple more um, here that I can see. Um, you mentioned the markets there for PI insurance. What do you expect um, the premiums to do in the next 12 months? Um, I think they, we're, we're going through the softening now and, and, and a soft market means more insurers, means more competition. And in Ireland, it doesn't take an awful lot of insurers. Like we're a small market, relatively speaking. We're about the size of a region in the UK. Um, so really, you know, one or two entrants can really disrupt the market a bit. Um, so there's a few that are gone through their period of pain and restructuring their book and saying goodbye to some accountancy practices and now they're kind of more comfortable where they are and they're going okay we're opening our books again which is frustrating in a way too but um i think there'll be more competition i do think there's a bit of downward pressure on premiums and uh we three years was probably a long time for a hard market so we're due um at least that again of a soft market is my is my uneducated guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and another question, is there a significant difference between the various insurers quoting um, PI for accountants? Um, for CAI members, less so because you have that clause that says they have to follow the minimum terms. Um, so you get that base level of cover. Apart from that, it's, it's kind of your... Some will give better sublimits um, or better. Uh, so a sublimit is, let's say you buy a 1 million limit, but there's a sublimit of 250,000 for loss of documents or something like that. So some will give better uh, sublimits. There, a lot of them can be bells and whistles. I mean, I've been in PI since 2007 or eight, um, and I haven't seen some of them ever called upon. So that they're not necessarily fundamental. So long story short, you get a good basic level of cover as a CAI member once you're with an approved insurer. Okay, that's great. Thank you. 
Um, I can't see any more questions um, now. So I think we've had quite quite a few questions there. Um, so thank you, Brian, again so much for such an informative and insightful session. I hope everybody found it the same. Uh, we will be um, distributing the slides um, to everybody in the next uh, day or two, um, together with the recording of the session. And we will also be posting the recording on our YouTube channel. So you can always get access to that. Um, afterwards. Um, so without further ado, um, thank you so much again uh, to everybody and I hope to see you soon on a different uh, webinar. <laughs> Thanks Anastasia. Great. Great, thank you. Bye bye.